Welcome, Scrum Masters. Welcome to Mindset and Heart Set. This is section two of the course. Here's what we'll be covering. I'll introduce the mental model framework. I'll give you one extended example, and then I'll describe the assignments. The outcome of this video lecture is that you will understand the Scrum Master's mindset and how to create your mental model. So let's start off with a definition. According to Wikipedia, a mental model is an explanation of someone's thought process about how something works in the real world. It is a representation of the surrounding world, the relationships between its various parts, and a person's intuitive perception about his or her own acts and their consequences. Mental models can help shape behavior and set an approach to solving problems akin to a personal algorithm and doing tasks. That's what Wikipedia says. My answer to what is a mental model is a little simpler. Let's take a look at it. I believe that a mental model is a model we create to simplify, organize, and act in the world. It often includes a commonly accepted set of theories, beliefs, and assumptions. Sometimes elements of the model will be contradictory. So let's look at some elements of a mental model. Beliefs, thoughts, ideas, emotions, strategies, heuristics, and techniques. And here are some examples. My mental model as a scrum master is that agile is better than waterfall. A strategy that's part of my mental model is plan, do, check, act. A technique is the burn down chart. So the mental model is a collection of all of these things. Here's a key question to ask. What mental model do you bring into your work as a scrum master? That's the key question that you'll be addressing in the assignments. So let me go through a detailed example of how I created one aspect of my Scrum Master Mental Model. You all know the Retrospective Prime Directive, which reads, regardless of what we discover, we understand and truly believe that everyone did the best job they could, given what they knew at the time, their skills and abilities, the resources available, and the situation at hand. The Retrospective Prime Directive is part of the mental model of many Scrum Masters. However, I didn't really believe it. Does everyone really do the best job they can in all circumstances? So I questioned this aspect of most Scrum Masters mental model. And here's what I did to investigate it and change my mental model. I started off by doing lots of research. I found this article by Linda Rising called Questioning the Retrospective Prime Directive. Let's see what she says. The prime directive is not about reality. It's about belief. It's about holding an idea for the sake of the retrospective. It's a game. Let's pretend. It's not a fact about the workplace or the people in it. Another person in the article is quoted as saying, I'd rather rewrite this directive. Regardless of what we discover, we assume that everyone did the best job they could, given what they knew at the time, their skills and abilities, the resources available, and the situation at hand. I continued to do more research. In an article by Martin Fowler, he writes, this kind of advice generates in me a feeling of deep revulsion. Immediately brings to mind images of motivational posters, school prayers, and two minutes hate. Empty rituals designed to quench curiosity and innovation, presided over by those whose minds are too empty to share my distaste. Then he goes on to say, faced with this evidence on the power of priming, it seems likely that focusing attention on the prime directive could well be priming people to take that more open and understanding frame of mind that's essential for a good retrospective. So however much I hate it, I should just bite my tongue and put up with it. So we've now seen two perspectives. Linda more or less accepts the prime directive, but says that it's make-believe. Martin Fowler accepts it after saying that it causes him feelings of deep revulsion. Let's look at one more person. Marcin Florian, in an article called What's Wrong with the Retrospective Prime Directive? My main objection to the Prime Directive, however, is that it explicitly pushes some issues into the undiscussable zone. If your retrospective lasts for two hours and happen every two weeks, starting every single one with a Prime Directive might be the best sign that your retrospectives are not working, the team is not getting on together, and that potentially the most pertinent and important problems will never be tackled. So Marson completely rejects the Prime Directive. Here's my synthesis. Let's remember, the mental model of most Scrum Masters says that regardless of what we discover, 
We understand and truly believe that everyone did the best job they could, given what they knew at the time, their skills and abilities, the resources available, and the situation at hand. The question in my mind is, what does it mean to do the best job? The best job at what? So here's my mental model. Everyone is doing the best they can to meet their needs, given their knowledge, skills, and resources. So my mental model is different than the standard retrospective prime directive. It says that everyone is doing the best they can to meet their needs. So it answers the question, what everyone is trying to be the best at. So I call this the needs-based prime directive. And once again, it's everyone is doing the best they can to meet their needs given their knowledge, skills, and resources. So note that the retrospective continues to be non-judgmental because everyone is doing the best to meet their needs. So you can't question or criticize everyone because everyone is doing the exact same thing. They're trying to meet their needs. Now, when there's a conflict between two members on a scrum team, the key questions to ask would be, what are your needs? What are my needs? What are you doing to meet your needs? What am I doing to meet my needs? How do these needs interact? How do our actions interact? And how do our actions support or not support the group? So this still contributes to the retrospective. This needs-based prime directive is still something that you can start every single retrospective with and use it to inform a non-judgmental retrospective. So this is an illustration of how I created one aspect of my Scrum Master Mental Model. So let's do an example using this needs-based prime directive to see how it leads to certain actions. Here's the situation. Alice left the team room when Bob needed her to check in the code. And Bob, he called Alice repeatedly and asked her to check in the code, but Alice said she was busy. So let's start off by asking, what are Alice's needs? Alice needs ease and tranquility. What are Bob's needs? Maybe he needs to be understood. He wants effectiveness. He wants to keep agreements. He wants consistency. He wants communication. Now, Alice's actions are not meeting Bob's needs, and Bob's actions are not meeting Alice's needs. So a good question to ask is, is there an action that both Alice and Bob can take which meets everyone's needs? And this is an actual example from something that happened on a team, and here's what they agreed to do. They agreed that all team members would be in the team room every day between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. So here's how an aspect of my mental model contributed to the team's success. So let's summarize what we've done so far. I've defined what mental model is, and I gave an example of how I've created one aspect of my Scrum mental model, the needs-based prime directive. And I gave you that detailed example because it's an illustration of the work that you need to do as an advanced Scrum Master. As a beginning Scrum Master, you can just adopt someone else's mental model. But as you advance, you need to create your own, just as I did here in this example. So let's look at the big picture. Why are mental models so important? Because they inform your actions. They inform how you relate to the team and people outside of the team. So understanding what your mental model is and making it explicit is absolutely critical to being a successful Scrum Master. What do you believe? What techniques do you use? What emotions do you bring to your team? And then every action has intended and unintended consequences. And if we don't understand our mental model, we don't understand our actions, which means that we can't correctly analyze the intended and unintended consequences. When we have an unintended consequence, one thing we can do is we can go back and examine our mental model and see if there's something that needs to be changed. So let's go back to the Alice and Bob example. Alice and Bob have mental models and their actions have the intended consequence of meeting their needs, but the unintended consequences of not meeting each other's needs. Note that Alice wasn't trying to hurt Bob or Bob wasn't trying to hurt Alice. They were just both trying to meet their needs and they accidentally hurt each other. Fortunately, a strategy exists which meets both Alice and Bob's needs, and they were able to arrive at it by exploring their needs and exploring their actions. So this is a great example of how an aspect of my mental model supported the team. How does your mental model support your team? Okay, so note that my scrum mental model includes the need-based prime directive. It's consistent with my belief of how the world works. It has the intended consequences of giving me great confidence when working with a Scrum team on their retrospective because I have the belief that everyone is doing the best they can to meet their needs. 
and I bring that understanding to the retrospective and share it with the team. Now, it also has the unintended consequence of distancing me from people who believe in the standard prime directive. I specifically disagree with that standard prime directive. Okay, so the, your next step here is to watch the non-predictive decision-making video. Non-predictive decision-making is another aspect of my mental model. So I'm giving you yet another example of an element of my mental model. And the idea is that you will take this, construct patterns out of this, and then create your own mental model in the assignments. Note that the needs-based prime directive and non-predictive decision-making don't need to be part of your mental model. They're just examples. You can include them or not include them. You can alter them or do something completely different. The key thing is that you explicitly construct your mental model. What do you believe to be true about the world? So the assignments are about exploring your mental model. What are the intended and unintended consequences? So your next steps are to watch the non-predictive decision-making video and complete the assignments. And to summarize, here's what we've done during this lecture. I've introduced the mental model framework. I've given an extended example of the needs-based prime directive and how I created it. And finally, I've described the assignments. Feel free to ask questions in the question area and make sure to get your 25-minute one-on-one coaching call with me scheduled before the end of this week.